What happened to the SEC this weekend? Disaster, implosion. Um, the SEC, over the span of an afternoon, sort of uh, imploded in on itself like a dying star. And a lot of us, I have to include myself, unfortunately, who had spent a majority of last week arguing hypothetical scenarios, like idiots, uh, had our mouths zipped shut because a lot of it was deemed irrelevant. Because when Alabama totes a third L, they don't look as attractive. That playoff resume doesn't look as great for Ole Miss. Once they tote a third L, once A&M laid into the evening at Jordan-Harris Stadium after the most ridiculous rule and format in college football was applied, doesn't really, doesn't really make your argument hold a lot of weight. And we've gotten this deep into the show. And a lot of you are wondering, well, where's, where's the Sarah McLaughlin special? It was in the entire SEC yesterday. Roll it, Colin. Ole Miss has everything in front of them. We're all in for 2024. This is it. This is our year. Collective, collective, collective. Third loss. Who to Georgia? Nah. Kentucky, uh, LSU, and, and Florida. Done. Bye. Next. Alabama. Everything in front of them. Wide open path to Atlanta. All we got to do is go beat a probably not bowl-bound Oklahoma and a lifeless Auburn. And who even knows what happens against Auburn? It's irrelevant. They're not going to Atlanta because they couldn't even go to Norman and score an offensive touchdown. Goodbye, Alabama. Next, Texas A&M. Tough on the road this year, but they've got an opportunity to rectify it. We got Texas on deck, but we're focused on Texas. Oh, excuse me, we're focused on Auburn. I should have known, but I watched it anyway. And A&M falls, not in regulation, but in overtime. And they suffer another loss. And the SEC's balloon just... And it's not all the way flat. It's not all the way popped. And crazier things have happened, so we'll see what happens this Saturday. But it was a volcanic Saturday for the SEC. And let me tell you something. My friends in Tennessee, my friends in Georgia, the volcano erupted, and the only reason you didn't get killed is because you guys just happened to be out of town. Because everyone who was in town pretty much died yesterday, figuratively, of course. Legally, I think we have to say that. Uh, I mean, hey, don't think I didn't see what UMass was doing to Georgia for a while. So I don't think it's done. I'm really worried. I don't think it's done. Now, of course, people think I have SEC tramp stamped on my lower back, and I don't. But what I had said about this conference is I think it's a better conference and a deeper conference than any conference in college football. Therefore, I think the strength of the typical SEC schedule, Missouri and Texas notwithstanding, is to be respected a little bit more than that of, say, Indiana or even a Penn State or even a Notre Dame. And the reason I had gone into that argument is because a lot of people have started to do the hypothetical of you can't let more than three teams or four SEC teams in. And I was like, well, if five deserve to be in, put five in. But then when they lose, guess what happens? With more information, you can change the tune you're singing. So you won't hear me sing that tune this week. Why? Because things changed. I will say this, though. I do disagree that the SEC is a bad conference this year. The SEC, to me, actually is still the highest caliber conference and is still the deepest conference this year. The SEC's problem is they got no elite teams. There is no 2019 LSU down here. If they were, they just buzzsaw the entire conference. There is no 2020 Alabama. If they were, they'd buzzsaw the entire conference. I think Oregon and or Ohio State would fare very well in the SEC this year. But what the SEC has is they got – no 10s, they got a bunch of 7s and 8s. And what happens to a bunch of 7 and 8s is they don't elevate to 10, therefore they are prone to this kind of stuff happening. You can think what you want about it, but a 2019 LSU is above the fray. Okay, Once they hit their stride, they'd go into Oklahoma and they'd destroy Oklahoma last night. They'd do the same thing on the road at Florida – uh, they, would, they would have done the same thing on the road at Auburn. The 2020 Alabama would have gone on the road to Auburn last night. They would have handled business. But we don't have that in the SEC this year. What we've got is we've got a bunch of pretty good to really good teams. But when you have that, remember what we talked about a few weeks ago? Speaking generically, great teams never play bad. Great teams' worst performances are just good. 
But good teams can turn in all sorts of variety of performance. Good teams can perform great, but good teams can perform bad. On average, they just play good. That's why they're a good team. But the difference when you go from having no elite teams to a bunch of good teams is it's just going to wildly vary week to week. Ole Miss can play like they did against Georgia. Ole Miss can play like they did against Florida, and it's the same team. You just have no clue what's coming. But um, the reason why I've made the argument that I was making about more SEC teams deserving to be in is because I've always given that conference benefit of the doubt because I respect the league schedule most teams play. But you also have to keep in mind, and I have all year, it's why I haven't said SEC schedule hardly at all, uh, the term SEC schedule doesn't mean much of anything. In the imbalanced nature of the scheduling of the league now, you could play Missouri's schedule or you could play Florida's, Georgia's schedule. You could play Texas's schedule, and it, they look completely different. So the, <laughs> the state of things right now is they may get as few as three teams in, also known as Danny Cannell Christmas List. But um, we do still have a week to play. Now, as much as I say that, that could also mean more chaos. That could mean Georgia Tech over Georgia. You know, that could mean any of a number of things. So it could be that the SEC's few remaining, like, prize eggs get cracked. But I think the best anti-SEC argument is one that I never even hear. I... And, and I appreciate you guys watching if you are or listening. If you are, please subscribe to the channel. I'm asking that a lot tonight, but only because we have found calls to action really work. Because most of you think you're subscribed, but you're not. And it costs nothing, and it's free, and it doesn't sign you up for anything. It just helps us. I'm going to do you a favor. If you're actually on board the anti-SEC train, and you just shout into the ether anytime that my name is associated with any of these teams... I'll make your argument for you. You're not even making the right argument. Most of the time, it's nonsense. I had to block a lot of people this weekend. I, I Brandon walker a lot of people. Never thought I'd see the day. But I have come to realize that there are a lot of folks who talk trash on the internet who do not watch the show. And do, they do not listen, and they cannot critically think. So maybe in 2025, after the new year, I'll unblock everybody. But I got no time for that right now. If you want to have a logic-based rebuttal to something I'm saying, that's fine. I'd actually love to do a whole show of that. That'd be totally fine. But if, if you, you know, after Texas A&M loses to Auburn, come at me and say, what happened to juggernaut Texas A&M? I got nothing for you because I never called them that. I've called them a very flawed team. I've called them all flawed teams. Anyway, here's the argument. If you really want to make the anti-SEC argument, what you ought to say is that's the trade-off. Losing these games, having to play in these environments, that's the trade-off to having access to the pipeline. Everyone talks about how South Carolina would perform in the Big 12. Well, that's a foolish notion, because if South Carolina were in the Big 12, they wouldn't have access to the media rights revenue share that they do because they're in the SEC. And also, let's be real, a lot of the recruits you land, you land because there is appeal to playing in the SEC. All of that's real. That's the argument you should be making. So you get to reap those benefits. You don't get to complain then when you have to compete against other teams that reap those benefits. That's the cost of doing business in the SEC. Have I been clear? That's the argument you ought to make. You ought to make that argument, and then it renders all of this, let's give SEC teams the benefit of the doubt, you aren't what your record says, you are a moot. I would have a counter to it. But I'm saying that in a debate setting, that'd be how to come at someone like, well, not like me because I've been slandered in this whole thing, but someone who is blindly espousing SEC bias, that's how you come at them. Now, I do want to say this. Uh, as I was being slandered, and all I want you guys to do is feel sorry for me. That's all I've ever wanted. I had, I don't know how many NFL scouts text me this weekend or come up to me at the game I was at and said, hey, we sit over here and watch. They're like sting in the rafters. They don't ever help out. They just watch. And they said, yeah, uh, clearly you're right about the different caliber of team or roster that exists in the SEC. We see it every week. Like we're on the road. We watch it every week. We know. But I looked for myself. Because I just feel like you get shortchanged 
when you go play. I will, I will defend this point to the day I die. Auburn's been a bad team this year. Oklahoma's been a bad team this year. Florida has been a bad team this year. And they got bad records, and they don't deserve to go anywhere other than maybe a minor bowl. But as I actually had a head coach text me this, I wrote it down. Head coach not in the SEC yesterday texted me and said, here's the difference in five and five in the SEC. That roster still could have 15 or 20 future NFL guys on it, and you may be playing in front of 90,000 people when you face them. And that's not something that exists anywhere else. Now, if you're a great team, you just go beat them into submission anyway. But you may not be a great team. And this year, we really don't have many elite teams out there. We just got a bunch of pretty good teams. So if you're Ole Miss, you're pretty good, you get thrown into that mix. Well, then you're going and you're facing a Florida team. Uh, you could be playing an Auburn team. You could be playing old Oklahoma. And I found it really interesting. I had producer Jesse. I told him, I don't care about their record. Go get me the blue chip ratio for those teams. And I want to compare it. You know, If I go play the bottom of the Big Ten right now, I'm playing Northwestern or I'm playing um, – I mean, who else would be that? Wake Forest would be like near the bottom of the ACC or whatever. Auburn's near the bottom of the SEC. Oklahoma, Florida, those teams are near the bottom of the league standings. Northwestern's got seven blue chip players on the roster. Auburn's got 43. But Wake Forest has five blue chip players on the roster. Oklahoma has 57. It doesn't change what those teams' records are. All it means is if you catch those teams on the wrong night, you're playing against future Sunday players. Like, you're playing against a bunch of guys that make you look at them and say, how are you 5-5? Five and five? It doesn't matter if they're 5-5, five and five, though, if you get them on the wrong night. If you get them on the wrong night, you're playing, you're playing a high-caliber team who's just been wildly inconsistent or has underachieved all year. But, you know, you get, I got Auburn last night. It's a perfect example. We've watched them all year, and I've said, I think that's like a top-25 caliber offense. They just can't stop turning the ball over. Well, voila, they don't turn the ball over last night, even turnover battle, and they hang 40-plus on Texas A&M. So it's an interesting thing. I will say this, though. You, you've got what you want from me. I'm not banging the SEC drum anymore. Yosette Conference has lost the benefit of the doubt, and at this point, uh, if a three-loss Alabama backs into the playoff, whatever. If they don't, whatever. But I'm not going to be sitting there fighting for them because I never wanted the playoff to expand anyway. So if we're fighting over three lost teams that have lost a quarter of the games they play, if we're fighting over whether they get it or not, I'm going to be almost indifferent towards it because they never would have had a slightest prayer in the four-team format anyway. And I told myself, self, when this 12-team playoff comes around, don't you be the fool who's arguing that number 13 got screwed because you know good and well, number 13 would have been an afterthought in the BCS era or an afterthought in the four-team era. And I do need help. I do need help because I cannot promise that I won't fall down that slippery slope.